All right. Um, welcome. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Axel Jansen, and I'm the Deputy Director of the German Historical Institute in Washington. It is my great pleasure indeed to welcome you all to the third part of our panel series on racism in history and context. The GHI is very glad to cooperate for this series with two wonderful partners, the German Historical Association and the Institute of European Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. I see there are still folks coming in, but I'll slowly continue because for today's panel, we have been able to recruit distinguished colleagues in the US and in Germany. In a moment, the two moderators, Akasemi Newsom and Johannes Paulmann, will introduce the panelists to you. Before I yield the screen, let me say a few things about the GHI. The German Historical Institute Washington is one of 10 institutes worldwide that are part of the Max Weber Foundation. The institutes built bridges between German academia and their respective host regions. The GHI and its Pacific Regional Office on the campus of the University of California at Berkeley served this role through conferences, fellowships, publications, and of course, through public events, events such as this one. The panel you are tuning into is the third panel in a series. Previous events focused on memory and knowledge in times of crisis and on health and the politics of race. And of course, you can find recordings of these events on our website. Today, we turn to another key issue, vaccines and distrust in medical science in times of crisis. And I can see that for today's event, we have an audience of currently, I think around 110, but, and it's still slightly growing. So folks are still joining us, which is great. So I'm grateful you're all here. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our panelists, our moderators, and everyone who was involved in making this event happen, especially Elisabeth Engel, Heike Friedmann, and Frank Kell. But now we'll turn over to Eva of the German Historical Association. Eva, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Axel. And a warm welcome also from my side. My name is Eva Schlotheuber, and I'm the chairwoman of the German Historical Association, which represents German historical scholarship in academia and the public sphere. The COVID-19 pandemic has relentlessly revealed the weaknesses and also the strengths of societies as if in a prism. Above all, it has shown the enormous role that history plays in dealing with the crisis and for the whole cohesion of societies. And this holds true especially for the experiences of individual social groups with epidemics, the access to knowledge and science, and their experience above all with medical research. Therefore, we decided to devote our third panel of the virtual panel series, Racism and History in Context, to trust and mistrust in medical science. We initiated the panel series to enjoy the possibility to discuss together the recent groundbreaking developments from a historical perspective and in a transatlantic comparison. And actually the pandemic helps because we, can, we wouldn't have been able to meet like we do today um, if not this online um, tradition would have been established. In Mexico, for example, indigenous communities like Aldama have a history, history of mistrust towards the federal government. In the best of cases, they have, been, they have been ignored. In the worst of cases, they have been subjected to land grabs, discrimination, abuse, and attacks. But vaccination is progressing very well in the US, but racial inequalities are clearly visible. In, in Germany, vaccination is not getting off the ground at all due to an abundance of caution. Without the identity forming experience background of the different societies and social group, and that is without our different histor historic histories, these processes cannot be understood. I'm very glad therefore that thanks to the wonderful cooperation with the German Historical Institute in Washington and the Institute of the European Studies in Berkeley, where I'm, hand uh, where I'm handing over now to Akasemi who will introduce to you the panelists for today. Akasemi, the floor is yours. Thank you to Axel and Ava, and welcome to all of you. My name is Akasemi Newsom, and I'm Associate Director of the Institute of European Studies at UC Berkeley. As my colleagues have mentioned, we have truly an exciting panel of experts together today for conversation with each other, the moderators, and you, our audience. 
some housekeeping details. This event is being recorded. And for the first half of the panel, Johannes Palman and I will alternate questions. Then at the midpoint of the session, we will turn to questions from you, our audience. Please uh, feel free to place your questions anonymously, if you wish, in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Now, this week on the Berkeley campus also marks Big Give 2021. This is a 24-hour fundraising drive that starts Wednesday, March 10th at 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time through Thursday, March 11th at 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, in which the Berkeley community rallies together with contributions amplified through event day awareness and a variety of social media-based contest prizes. Your gift of any amount made to the Institute of European Studies helps expand educational opportunities for our students and enrich their learning experience at Berkeley. My colleague Heike is posting in the chat links to learn more about the Big Give and as well to make a gift to the Institute. Now to turn to our panelists. Uta Fravert is the Managing Director of the Max Planck Institute for hum Human Development where she has led the Research Center for the History of Emotions since 2008 and published work on the politics of humiliation, among other topics. Samuel Kelton Roberts is Associate Professor of History, Sociomedical Sciences, and African American and African Diaspora Studies at Columbia University, where he also leads the research cluster for the historical study of race, inequality, and health. Sarah B. Rodriguez is a senior lecturer in global health studies, a lecturer in medical education, and senior faculty in medical humanities and bioethics at Northwestern University School of Medicine. Malta Thiessen is director of the Institute for Regional History in Münster at the Westphalia Lippe Regional Association with research interests and publications in the history of vaccines in 19th and 20th century Germany. As I mentioned, there will be two co-moderators for this panel. I will be one. The second will be my colleague, Johannes Palman, who is director of the Leibniz Institute of European History in Mainz and a professor of modern history at Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz. Now to turn to our first question. As the COVID-19 pandemic continues to disproportionately impact racialized populations around the globe, vaccination programs are emerging as a new arena for racism and its manifestations. It has already become apparent, for example, that structural disadvantages in access to healthcare, as well as doubts about the integrity of medical scientists threaten to undermine vaccines as an effective and widespread cure for the global crisis. Now, in an introductory statement, could you give the audience a sense of the geographic, temporal, and analytical scope of your work and how it illuminates the historical relationship between medical science and public health on the one hand and society and racism on the other? So we'll go in alphabetical order and, and start perhaps with you, Uta. Oh, thank you very much. Um, well, I'm kind of um, revisiting a topic that I've been dealing with uh, in my dissertation, which is now about 40 years ago. So I, I, um, I nearly forgot what I'd written then, but it was a, it was a book uh, that was um, strongly inspired at that time in the uh, early 80s by Michel Foucault's idea of or concept of medicalisation uh, of the um, state run um, access or, or we could also, uh, also call it supervision uh, of the population uh, by medical authorities. And uh, what I was interested then, and that clearly diverges from our current focus on racism, um, I was interested in how these medical policies actually worked uh, for different strata of, the, uh, of society. And um, I mainly focused on the uh, lower classes, on 
people who were not living in the cities, who did not have access to medical doctors, who were just a tiny group uh, within the broader um, medical or semi-medical profession, um, who were living in rural areas without any access to these uh, medical institutions, um, or in case there were, they did have access to medical institutions like um, these early hospitals in the late 18th and early 19th century, um, they were used actually as a, a kind of guinea pigs for medical um, experiments and, and also medical practice, something that uh, has been largely forgotten now in our countries, but that is still very much the case in the international travel of medical students to African countries, as my <laughs> Um, that's anecdotal evidence from my daughter who spent some time in uh, Ethiopia and watched her fellow students from Munich University uh, exhilarate about possibilities that were open to them in Addis Abeba, uh, which were not open to them in Munich. But this is uh, as an aside. So I, my, my um, um, interest then in, in the early 1980s was really focused on social inequality, social and gendered inequality, uh, as it played out in uh, Prussia, in this case, the largest German state, between around uh, 1750 and 1880, and 1880 actually marking the beginning of a national health system in terms of national insurance system. So I was interested in what actually happened before and how this, how the, how such medical policies uh, actually came about. That's one strand of, of my expertise. And I actually had to take out the book again and read what I had written um, 40 years ago on uh, smallpox vaccination and cholera in 1830s. And it seemed all very new to me. I had, I had nearly forgotten uh, most of it, actually. So thank you again for making me revisit this work. The second strand um, that I'm coming from is the history of trust. So much later in my academic life, I've spent um, quite, yeah, quite some time in um, researching moments of trust, structures of trust as they develop in modern societies, again, uh, since the uh, since the late 18th century in uh, Europe, mostly European societies, um, and funnily, or not, it's actually not funny. It's just very tellingly. The very first uh, encyclopedia that was published in the 1740s in Germany, a very early product of um, religiously minded men, of course, um, when they had a a lengthy article on trust um, in those days, nine, nine tens of which were dealing with the trust in God. But the rest, the one tenth, the 10 percent, um, were enumbering uh, a number of instances or a number of social relationships, rather, uh, where trust uh, in this view actually played a pivotal role. And the most conspicuous um, um, example of trust um, was named the doctor-patient relationship. Of course, we now have to remember that such a relationship only existed between, again, coming back to the question of social inequality, between um, pretty well-off urban dwellers and, um, and medical doctors with some kind of um, university training. And uh, so the, the great bulk of the population was, of course, excluded. But at the same time, uh, this was presented, this relationship was presented as the, um, yeah, the, the prime example of a, a trustworthy and trust-built relationship, which, of course, lets us think about distrust as well. So proximity, social proximity, um, um, also, spatial proximity obviously is something that propels trust, while um, the lack of such proximity, the distance that people fell towards academic institutions, towards academic pro professionals, of course, um, influences their, their degree of mistrust. And that's also something that we can follow up 
um, throughout the uh, 19th and 20th century. Um, I think I'd rather leave it at that for the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Uta. And now, Samuel. Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to those of you on the West Coast. Good evening to those of you in Europe. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. Thank you to the organizers and all the various institutes and academic entities involved. I've really very much been looking forward to the, this conversation. Uh, briefly, I arrive here vis-a-vis -vis principally work I did at the, much like Uta, I think Uta and I have quite a bit in common, um, at least in a couple of regards. Um, and one of which is revisiting work that I did in the past. Um, some, you know, several years ago, I published a book on uh, the politics of infection and race, um, racial inequality in the United States, focusing particularly on tuberculosis. And this was a book which came out in 2009, and uh, which I really had thought would had done its work at this point. And then, and then of course, the pandemic happens, and then. I've been asked to speak more about this book in the past year than I had probably in the previous five years. Um, and there's, I just have to say as an aside, there's really nothing more odd than, the, than having to reread your own book so that you're competent to discuss your own book. But this is, uh, this is where I found myself in 2020 um, as, as we confronted this you know, historically unprecedented crisis. My arguments about tuberculosis, which I don't, I don't think this is news to anybody um, in the audience and certainly not on the panel, um, you know, in looking at tuberculosis as the consummate disease of class inequality in um, emerging urban industrial areas. And I address the historiography on this from a lens of thinking after HIV had arrived um, which is to say, we have had this brief period of a few decades when we had almost vanquished infection, um, and then HIV proved us all wrong. You know, it's uh, one of those things, and, and God said ha and laughed at us. Um, and many, uh, we historians were rushing to figure out what was the precedent for this, for the last time we had such a disease that was so stigmatized, so mysterious, so devastating. Um, and wasting of its victims and entire communities. And so a number of us looked at tuberculosis. And for me, what I found particularly interesting was that not only was tuberculosis one of the um, foundational moments in the establishment of the modern public health state in the United States. Uh, this is in the late 19th century. It's with TB that we have modern um, uh, mechanisms of disease reporting, of, of sanitary inspections, it's, it goes down the line. But also baked into this were ideas of racialization. So that what emerged very quickly and persisted even beyond the period of tuberculosis after the 1940s were differential public health states, in fact. Uh, what we found is uh, ways in which the politics of race easily could be used to harmonize, uh, you know, what a, like an old school materialist analysis would call, you know, contradictions. Um, in, in an emerging industrial economy. So that we have a public health state, which for many of our white citizens in the Jim Crow period, which is say the period of segregation in the United States, was more focused on protecting whites while also quarantining either literally or symbolically African-Americans. Um, this was uh, something that I've, that I've you know, wrestled with for a long time. And like I said, I had thought I had uh, left it behind, and then COVID showed up, where, you know, much to, to my um, dismay, and I think for all of us, we found that here in the United States, many of these dynamics were replicated. I know this is a discussion for later in the panel, but I think certainly we have seen echoes of how we used to do public health over 100 years ago and, and how we're doing it today. So, uh, while I've, I'm always happy to, to join colleagues such as the esteemed ones here and to discuss work, even work that I've done some time ago, I've since moved on to other topics. Um, I have to say it's with a certain amount of unease that, that, that the ideas are still relevant for to, not just for history, but for our contemporary politics. Um, but that said, I am looking forward to this discussion. And again, I want to extend my thanks to all the organizers and to Akasemi and to Johannes for uh, hosting and moderating. Thank you so much, Samuel. And now we'll turn to Sarah. All right. Um, 
So thank you. Also, I'd like to extend my thanks for being invited to this panel. I've also been looking forward to it for quite a while. And I say I come to it this from doing medical history and being particularly interested in clinical practice and the history of clinical uh, research, in particular, what makes both of those ethical um, and when maybe they overlap, when research is actually clinical care, et cetera. And per what was also has already been said, I'm also interested in issues of trust then. Trust as well as access, um, who's access to clinical care, as well as who's been subjected to clinical care, who's had access to clinical research, who's been subjected to clinical research. Um, and again, sort of um, focusing then on trust as well as the ethics and sort of thinking ethically about this. And I come to it from both my work, which has been largely sort of thinking about um, surgery, but not exclusively surgery, but sort of surgery um, and the history of surgery with practices, but also thinking to my teaching has been a lot of this as well. I was sort of thinking about the history of ethical practice when I think of research and ethical care when it sort of comes to clinical care. And again, going back to issues of trust, sort of trust in individual physician, as well as trust more largely in sort of the, edu of the medical system. Um, because so often historically, as probably we'll get into more in this panel and the panelists all know, so often medicine has been used to both reflect as reinforce sort of hierarchies among bodies and differences among bodies. So I'm looking forward to the further discussion. Thank you so much, Sarah. And now we will turn to Malta. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to the fantastic panel. Thank you, Akasemi, for your question and uh, for your statements. I already learned a lot. Um, at, at first glance, my, my focus of research might sound a little bit boring. In my, in my work, I, I just focus on de developments in Germany. And even worse, I'm not a historian with great expertise in, in medical issues, to be honest. Uh, what I find interesting is the relationship between vaccines on, on the one hand and social norms and social orders on the other hand. And that's what I'm, what I'm trying to do in my work. I anal analyze the relationship between the individual and society, debates about the rights and duties of the state uh, and about threats to society. And against this background, it's no coincidence that immunity is not only a medical matter, but more than that, a political one, of course. And that's, uh, uh, that's particularly true when, it, uh, when we talk about racism. Vaccination campaigns are always about belonging. Vaccines raise the question of uh, who should belong to our society, who is worthy of, uh, of protection, or who is a threat to society. Um, and that's why, at a second glance, I think the history of Germany in 19th and 20th century is a perfect scope for the history of vaccination. Um, one could even say you got five different systems for the price of one uh, in 19th and 20th century. We could trace the history of vaccination in the German Empire, in the first democratic republic of Germany, in the Weimar Republic, in the Third Reich, and after that in the Socialist GDR and in the Federal De De Democratic Federal Republic. So um, let me give you just three brief points where I think Germany could be of interest for our panel. First of all, maybe too obvious, um, we could study the long history of antisemitism. During the Third Reich, vaccines were criticized as Jewish poison a poison to weaken and destroy the German Volkskörper, the people's body. But this narrative wasn't invented from the Nazis, of course, and we can trace it back into 19th century and even in the Middle Ages when Jews were accused of poisoning wells. And what is even more important, the relationship of vaccines and antisemitism did not come to an end after the Third Reich. We, we can hear the same stories even today for example, at demonstrations against public health measures. So if you look at Germany, you got the history of vaccination and anti-Semitism in a long degree. Secondly, the success of vaccination campaigns depends on fears of pandemics. Samuel already um, um, stressed that. That's why racism played an important role in convincing the Germans of vaccines. 
the dirty Jew or the filthy foreigner even become a kind of a marketing ploy, one could say, to win over the Germans. Racism was used to stir up fear, fears of pandemics and though to get the Germans to the needle to be vaccinated. And thirdly, German history is a transnational history, of course. That's particularly true in, in case of vaccines. Since the 1950s, many vaccines in Western Germany came from the, from the US or from the United Kingdom, from Canada or from France. On the other side of the Iron Curtain in the GDR, most of the vaccines came from the Soviet Union. And for German physicians in East and West, this was a shock at first, because for, for decades, decades before, the Germans had felt avant-garde in medical research. Since the 1950s and 1960s, though, Germans had to learn from foreigners and even worse, from former enemies. So I, to sum up, I hope that my scope at Germany is not as boring as it may sound at first. Thank you. Thank you so much, Malta. Now I will pass the baton to my colleague Johannes for the next question. We have a lot to talk about. Thank you, Akasemi. Um, welcome from Mainz um, as well. It's a pleasure to moderate this distinguished panel and learn by asking questions, I must say. And I'll start with the general questions to all of you. Um, and I'll start off with models of thought with regards to infectious diseases. Um, they come from Foucault, and you may have heard about them. It's the leprosy model, the plague model, and the smallpox model. And they um, have different ways of treating and tackling diseases. The leprosy model separates the healthy from the sick, and it, in most cases no longer cares for them. And the instruments used are special segregated homes and spaces for the sick. The plague model, everyone is subjected to a re regime of discipline, and the instruments used are quarantines, curfews, and other things. The smallpox model um, is controlling the pathogen, the virus, or the bacteria, while leaving some degree of freedom to individuals. Instruments used are gathering statistics on infections, on mortality, based on these statistics, assessing risks, and providing vaccines. If you take these as models of thought, rather than a historical development, although they sort of seem to follow um, um, patterns of uh, infections one after the other. We can try placing vaccines, and that's the topic today, in a broader context of dealing with diseases. The question I would like to put you is, how do you place vaccines uh, within these coexisting models of segregation, discipline, and risk assessment? And are these models, and particularly their combination in historical practice, a useful way of understanding racialized disease treatment and control? And I think we'll start alphabetically again, and which means starting with you, Ute. <clears throat> well, thank you for a very challenging question. As I mentioned, I've started my dissertation, or written my dissertation with Foucault at the back of my head. Uh, and I've continuously then uh, taken my distance <laughs> in, in, in the work to come, in the work to follow. Um, because I think, well, first of all, such models, let's, let's put it this way, such models are always helpful because they help you and they actually incite you and push you to criticize them and um, come up with better ones, or at least maybe not with better ones, with other ones. And what uh, I don't like about, um, about Foucault's three uh, stages, so to speak, uh, is that um, he only looks basically from the end point of a, certain, um, of a certain model. So he looks at, say, I can't actually comment on, on, on um, plague and, and uh, leprosy, um, but with regard to, to smallpox, he looks at it from the point when the state, and that's always his main concern, the state, this machine of the state, when the state installs the duty to get vaccinated, which in Prussia, for example, happens very, very late in the day. That happens in 1874, but that people were experimenting with variolation and vaccination started in the 1770s, so 100 years ago. And to look at the process, how 
this model of vaccination then actually became dominant and, and took the stage, uh, alerts you to many inconsistencies, to many contradictions that have no place and to many sorts of agents, different sorts of agency, agency by different groups that have no place in Foucault's model. So that's why I'm, I'm kind of taking my distance. But one thing that I would like to stress is that um, when he argues that vaccination, the vaccination, the smallpox model actually comes with a, a degree of, of, well, you know, what we might call it liberal individualization. Um, this has a downside, of course, because the, uh, the, um, the importance that you attach, that you attribute to indiv the individual's agency, so behave in a, in a right way, uh, try to live a healthy life, try to keep away from, from sources of infection, try to um, practice a healthy lifestyle, et cetera, et cetera. This, is, this, this all has a kind of social, um, and I'm coming back to this uh, social uh, dimension rather than racial dimension here, um, uh, this has a social background. You can only do so, and that's something which we all, all also experienced during the COVID crisis, um, probably most conspicuously in the US, uh, less so in Europe. Uh, you can only live a healthy life once you have access to certain resources of clean water, of time, of distancing, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, it's a class issue basically, and not something that re really refers to the individual. So individualization actually comes with social differentiation, um, which then blurs the picture uh, to, to a degree that Foucault, I think, has not really thought about. Thank you. I'll pass on the word to Samuel. Um, is it a class issue only? <laughs> but you can answer the general uh, question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think I'll stick with the general question. Um, I I entirely uh, agree in terms of the class dimension. I, I think that's you know virtually irrefutable. Um, and of course, by class we mean something that's you know very very complicated as well. So I'm in complete agreement. And in hearing Uta's answer, I was struck by you know how similarly I would like to answer the same question even though in, perhaps in a different context i think here i've you know i've been paying most attention to the united states and i live here in the in the city of new york in the state of new york and we certainly have kind of a differential um maybe modalities of doing disease of doing public health here um and doing covid19 uh prevention and treatment and and study uh that touches i think on all three of these uh Foucauldian stages certainly in the leprosy model uh, I mean, something that I, that has just really, you know, just just been a stark example of this is how, for example, we've treated people in uh, incarcerated settings, in jails and prisons. Most states, and you know, by the CDC, C Centers for Disease Control, our federal health uh, public health agency, um, you know, most states have prioritized people who live in quote unquote congregate settings, meaning people, you know, who live in um, elderly care, um, you know, special residential uh, facilities, uh, in some, in many states, homeless shelters, et cetera. But too many states actually have ignored uh, prisons, which were one of three major hotspots throughout 2020. Um, prisons, uh, elderly care, and meatpacking plants were the three most dangerous places to live and work in the United States uh, last year. And uh, we've really failed in that. We've basically turned, and as any, I think as anyone in the audience and certainly the panel knows, the United States leads the world in uh, rates of incarceration. And that type of uh, orientation towards that population, um, you know, has continued with our COVID policy. I think in terms of uh, a plague model, uh, I think the, as you articulated the question, Johan, is, um, you said uh, everyone is subjected to a regime of discipline, quarantine, curfews, et cetera. I would say it, here in the United States, in some ways, being able to quarantine, or as we called it, shelter in place, wasn't only a matter of being subjected to it. Because as you know, famously, we had lots of people who just you know, flaunted all the guidelines and regulations and even laws about COVID control. But also, it was a luxury in a lot of ways. And, and there were many people here 
who would have loved to have sheltered in place, um, but could not. Uh, they had, you know, they, we they had jobs that they had to work that that required engagement with the public, and um, our our social security net here is so anemic, so weak that there was no way possible that we could have, you know, paid all of these people to stay at home and shelter in place as we had asked them to do. Uh, so in a lot of ways, I, you know, I would flip that question on its head and not say subjected to, but allowed the luxury of. Um, in terms of the smallpox model, uh, I have to think about that because even as how, um, even as we start to collect statistics um, and, you know, to think about our risk and kind of a, a, a landscape of risk, that too was always, as Uta said, inflected with, you know, these deeply embedded uh, class, not just assumptions, but really priorities. You know, how we thought about risk itself, um, completely uh, neglected structural inequities, structural racism, um, you know, and all these, all these things all of a sudden came as a surprise in the late spring and summer of 2020, when I think any of us who had critically studied public health, not just as historians, you know, all of us in the multi, in you know, the kind of multiverse of disciplines that are engaged in this, um, you know, could have predicted this, but our, our, um, our epidemiologists did not and were caught off guard when we started to see these really stark disparities and inequities in not just infection and mortality, but also who was able to get their hands on protective uh, you know, prophylactic devices such as masks. Uh, testing was a really problem in those early months of the pandemic. And even now, as we look at vaccines, um, you know, the, the access to vaccines is very unequal. And it's not because of need, but really about kind of machinations, machinations of, of the marketplace. So I think there's a lot to be done with these Foucauldian. I mean, I'm a, a you know, I think a kind of maybe an unreconstructed Foucauldian in a lot of ways myself um, in my own career. But I think uh, there's also ways that, you know, those rubrics there can be built upon um, as I think all of us have over the past, you know, four decades. Okay, thank you very much, Samuel. Um, and I'll pass on to Sarah. <clears throat> all right, thank you. So kind of building on the theme of building on um, these uh, models, then I'm just gonna sort of piece actually a couple of points from each of the model a little bit to sort of think about trust in vaccines a little. So first, sort of the leprosy model and separating the healthy from the sick, kind of building on what's already been said. This is an assumption that that's a sort of a known quantity, right? That this is healthy and this is sick, that there's sort of a, an even metric, if you will, as opposed to built, there's already built into who is deemed healthy and who is deemed sick. And Speaking from someone who also teaches in a medical school, <laughs> that I teach history of medicine to medical students, you know, it is sort of growing and increasing in the 19th century with sort of the rise of medicine was this need to sort of figure out this is pathology and this is normal. But too often that's taught then as well as taught now that that's sort of that there's sort of a clean assessment of how that happens as opposed to saying there's an awful lot of assumptions that have gone in, including racial and racist assumptions into who is the healthy body and who is the sick body. And so sort of thinking about that, that sort of in one way sort of simple ideas, separating the healthy from the sick. Actually, there's an awful lot that's not simple about sort of thinking who is deemed healthy and who is deemed sick. And then second, a sort of plague model, right, is everyone subjected to um, this sort of discipline and quarantine. And, and going off of, yeah, it's a privilege in some ways to be sort of able to do that. But then also thinking not everyone, both thinking now, not everyone has the privilege to sort of be able to work from their attic like I'm doing right now. Not only has that sort of privilege, but to also know that that has so often historically not been um, actually um, uh, put into practice in any sort of way that is actually everyone. And classically, we can think of what happened actually with plague in San Francisco, where they only sort of segregated out Chinatown. Okay, and so you could famously, if you were white, you could cross in and out of Chinatown, but if you actually lived there on of Chinese descent, you couldn't. Sort of thinking of like, not everybody was impacted the same way of sort of this idea that the plague model is everyone sort of subjected to quarantine. That has definitely played out along racial and racist lines. And then finally, the smallpox 
going with this idea of assessing risk, that also sort of risk sort of is set up as being possibly as this neutral kind of tool when historically we know that's not true. So who is deemed risky, what behavior is deemed risky has had all kinds of um, pulling from other sorts of, um, particularly here racial and racist ideas, but also class ideas, also gender ideas about what behavior is deemed sort of risky and not risky and to me that definitely then plays out when we think about vaccine because as we're seeing right now vaccine distribution is unevenly applied and so all of these sort of models unevenly historically they've been unevenly historically applied and I think pulling from these models one of the big takeaways is to say uneven like this has been historically incredibly uneven and some and oftentimes um, un, very unevenly and unequitably. Yeah, thank you very much, Sarah. I think your point, particularly on the separating the healthy from the sick, I mean, if we look at COVID, we just don't know. Even if we're testing, we don't know for sure whether someone is sick or healthy and in what state. Um, so that makes this idea of separating pretty difficult in practice. Um, um, I'm passing on to Malta, um, general question. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I think it's very interesting what you said, uh, that you stressed the coexistence of, of uh, three approaches at one time. And I think that's uh, a very good view to, to look at vaccines. So at, at first glance, of course, vaccines are the smallpox model. Um, vaccines against smallpox, uh, Ute's uh, work is fantastic. Uh, I read it uh, every <laughs> every week, I think, <laughs> especially this year. <laughs> um, so vaccines against smallpox uh, were the first modern campaign and, and a kind of wake up call for modern public health systems. Um, but if you take a closer look at vaccinations in the 20th century, you can find the other two models in, in vaccination campaigns too. So it's, um, so if you, if, you, if you think about the leprosy model, um, if we consider vaccines at, at global scale, vaccines were, and, and even are today, a tool for segregation. So vac vaccination campaigns for a long time aimed first at the safety of one's own nation and not at the safety of, of others. Um, it took a very long time for, for countries in the North to, to fight pandemics in a global approach. The first global campaign, the smallpox eradication program of the World Health Organization um, only ran in the 1960s and 1970s. And the vaccination campaign against polio even started two decades later. I think, in, I think it was in the 80s. And tuberculosis, as Samuel uh, could say uh, many more, um, tuberculosis, for example, still is a problem in many states in, in, in Africa and Asia today, killing one and a half million people every year, I think. Um, and here the question of racism becomes very important. Tuberculosis, polio, and even H, uh, HIV or AIDS are today often seen as diseases of others. And that's why many diseases are not on the agenda of our public health system. So that might be the interpretation of the leprosy model. And if we, in terms of the pest model, you can find that in vaccination campaigns too, especially if we look at disciplination. Um, even today, many states dream of vaccinations as a, as a duty to the state or as a duty to the people. In Germany, for example, this was the case in 2019, when German Ministry of Health, um, Jens Spahn, introduced a compulsory vaccination against measles. And today, many politicians are dreaming of compulsory or mandatory vaccination against COVID. So racism, I think, plays a major role here too. The introduction of compulsory vaccination is often justified by the unreliability of foreigners and migrants. In this view, in Germany, for example, Turkish or Polish people communities are often stigmatized as hotspots and a threat to common good to justify um, um, mandatory vaccinations, for example. So to conclude, I think Foucault's three models are very helpful to be aware of the coexistence um, of different approaches at one time, even in one country and even in one measure like vaccinations. Thank you. Thank you very much for your answers. Um, I've been talking a lot to a sociologist recently and he loves these models. So I've got now good arguments from you um, to continue arguing with him. Uh, and I'll pass on to Akasimi. Uh, <clears throat> 
Okay, I want to also mention to our audience that if you have questions, please do post them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Now, my question uh, is, is for Uta. So, you know, the current moment of the COVID-19 crisis has been marked by fear rooted in rumors and misinformation about the source and nature of the disease. For example, malicious intent has been attributed to governments distributing the vaccine on both sides of the Atlantic. Can you address the different politics of emotions which past public health crises have engendered uh, by states in Germany, Europe, and or the US? And in the different periods you've studied, do states consistently evoke wartime emotions to gain public compliance, particularly around vaccines? And, and if not, you know, what kinds of emotions do states invoke? And how does that differ among gendered and racialized citizens and subjects? And do you see any, any connections in past periods between emotions and trust in medical authority? So Uta, I'd be very glad to, I'm sure we would all be glad to hear your thoughts and views on, on this. You don't want to hear all of that, because that's a, um, well, it's a mind-blowing set of questions, actually, and I, I, I can't possibly answer all of it now, all of them now, but let me, let me start by just noting differences between, um, between the metaphors of um, a war uh, on or against um, COVID, um, a battle against COVID that have been floating around, um, mainly coming from politicians. So if I, if I followed the debate correctly, um, both the um, French President Macron, the um, American then uh, former president, fortunately, uh, Donald Trump, but also um, voices from Britain use that very militaristic language. They proclaim this war against a, uh, a virus. And um, I felt kind of uh, thrown back into the 19th century when such uh, metaphors were uh, really very, very frequent all over Europe. Uh, it was a much more belligerent phase in, in European history. Um, people or states, nations went to war quite a bit, even before the great wars then of the 20th century. And they also felt that um, the state of progress that they had achieved or were about to achieve or wanted to achieve was only being won by constant battle, constant battling. So all the medical doctors, all actually also explorers they were called heroes, like the military heroes that, that go to war against, uh, against nation state, against states. Um, heroes that, that um, uh, overcame certain dangers or certain insecurities and actually achieved a lot for you know, mankind, first mankind, or maybe first their own, uh, they, uh, your own uh, fellow citizens, but also mankind, mankind really mattered a lot. It was not just about your own, your own uh, little turf, uh, national turf. And so this, this um, language of, of um, basically belligerence um, was again a, a trope, a very familiar, it was very familiar during the 19th century, but has by and large um, disappeared, especially in the second half of the, uh, the 20th century, or so I thought. And the experience now of COVID um, uh, proved me, I wouldn't say better, but worse. Because uh, I, I, I always thought that war, uh, waging war on a, on a virus is just the wrong image, the wrong picture. Um, because it's not an enemy, it's not only kind of uh, attacking me as a member of a nation state in Europe or, or where else. It doesn't have any malicious purposes or intents. It's just, you know, it just does what, what it wants to replicate, multiply and, and live on. And um, so no malicious <laughs> intentions at all. Um, and so you might think, why 
is this, are these metaphors, these very militaristic or militant metaphors actually being used? And I think they're being used um, uh, in order to rally support, uh, national, most, mostly national support for a cause, relying citizens behind their government that is supposed to be at the forefront of battling, of, com of, of combat, basically, against, against the virus. Now, um, um, something um, we, we, you asked me about the different, maybe emotional regimes. Something that was very, very, um, again, prevalent during the 19th century, especially in Germany with this, um, but also France. I mean, Germany and France were competing very, very, uh, closely uh, for medical progress. Pasteur against Koch. I mean, that was the, um, um, yeah, a, a, a perfect and continuous competition. And um, both countries made themselves known and, and built that reputation of high class um, universities. Americans in those days came over to study in Germany rather than the other way as we, uh, as we watch it now. Um, and and um, medical, the medical business or the medical profession and uh, backed by natural sciences was, of course, the, 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 the avant-garde of, of all that um, progress, of this scientific progress. And it was very well received. So people trusted it. And when I say people, I'm not just talking about you know, the sons and daughters of medical professors and wives, of course, not to forget them, but also people on the street, people who were organized in the, in you know, more than a million was organized in the social democratic workers movement. And they also did a lot to popularize science and to build and also kind of um, strengthen this very, very high reputation and the trust in science. Um, I, I see, I do see that this trust has then dwindled um, uh, in, in the 20th century and, and most, of, uh, most of all then during the 1930s and, and 40s. Um, and uh, is now, there was a, is in, in the beginning of COVID, at least in this country, there was a short moment when people were really, um, enthusiastic about science again. You know, we all became experts in uh, virology. We all knew what to talk about. And it's not just academics. This knowledge really kind of dissipated or, or yeah, was, was uh, trickling uh, everywhere. And um, um, these famous virologists who did their podcasts and were on, the, uh, on, on TV basically twice a day or, or more often, they, they gained star power. They were really heralded as our new heroes. Um, and uh, unfortunately, this very high trust in, in, in science that we were witnessing in the first months has again dwindled due to a misunderstanding, that's how I would put it, a misunderstanding what science is. Uh, science is not you know, absolute knowledge. It's not absolute truth. It's all, it's kind of getting closer to truth by, you know, validation, but also falsi falsification. And people didn't understand, didn't want to understand that there is not no eternal and no absolute truth in science. And then they were, many were disappointed and turned their back to science and say, well, you know, if they, if they speaking with different voices and, and contradicting each other and, and fighting each other, then what is there to be gained from science? So again, a new, uh, I would say, wave of distrust opening up um, in front of our eyes. That's it for the moment. Thank you so much, Uta. And if I may just follow up very brief with a question. Uh, you, you said that the um, trust in medical authority originated in, in some part um, in the careers of Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch, who were able to engender this cross-class trust in medical authority, linked in part to the kinds of work that they were doing, I believe. And I'm wondering, since in the 19th century, 
both Germany and France were imperial powers, do you think this trust extended to colonial subjects as well? How, how would you grapple with the colonial subject and trust in medical authority? Um, unfortunately, like I say, I'm the wrong person to ask because I'm not, I'm, I've, um, I just, um, I've read um, bits and pieces on, um, on, well, on experiments that had been done uh, in the colonies and, but I, I'm, and, and of course, from, from today's perspective, we, um, we are uh, aghast, we are, um, um, it's obscene in, and obnoxious in, in many ways. Um, I'm not so sure how people, um, and also people who were, and I think we can use this um, term subjected in this case, who were subjected to such experiments, for example, in Eastern Africa, where, where Koch um, uh, worked on the, what is it, sleeping disease. Um, uh, if they thought this way, uh, I'm just, I just don't have this, the empirical knowledge if people were uh, aware that they were being subjected or if they thought, well, you know, there is this doctor from, white doctor from Berlin who has, uh, um, uh, I'm not sure if you already got the Nobel Prize, who, well, who has this high reputation and, and has found out everything about tuberculosis, et cetera, et cetera, not, not enough, but still something. Um, and now he's here to cure us and help us. Um, if this was something that was shared by those who were subjected to these experiments, or if they were aware at the time that this was an experiment that probably, um, but I'm not even sure about that, it probably would not have been done to um, workers uh, um, in, in Berlin at that time. Um, because even workers in Berlin at that time were subjected to to certain treat to a certain treatment that we would nowadays call um, obscene and and out of the question. So it's a, it's it's very hard actually. Actually, I'm 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 struggling. You can can see that and hear that. I'm struggling with applying the um, the, the the kind of appropriate criteria to judge what people thought then and what we today think and what people in East Africa said or thought then and felt then and what they would uh, do, they, how, how they would deal with the question today. Thank you, Uta. Now I'll turn it over to Johannes. I think Malte, can you, or would you want to come in on that topic? I seem to remember from your book that there might be something in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Maybe. yeah, it, it should. I so, hope I'm not putting uh, any wrong. Uh, <laughs> thank I'm you. Sorry, that's the end of my purpose. Uh. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I struggle as, as Ute is struggling with it. Um, so uh, what I think, uh, what is interesting, the colonial uh, perspective is um, the same experiments. Um, um, they, um, as, a, as a practice in Africa, um, I think it was the same um, practice in Germany too. So uh, what's Ute try uh, thinking about um, the, the if the experiments were a problem in in their in their time, or or wasn't it it's just a feeling? Uh, okay, so we are we are we are doing um, for the for the good um, for the for a healthy society. So it was quite normal to um, to to uh, the practice of ex, uh, experiments, human experiments, even in in Germany. Uh, so like in um, in schools or in um, and with uh, with um, you know, children without parents, um, even until the 1950s and 1960s. I think that's another perspective. Um, not to say that the colonial experiments. Uh, well, harmless, of course not, but uh, I think uh, we have to put it in perspective of the thinking of, um, yeah, of planning and making a better society, um, even um, with victims in the in their own uh, in their own country, uh, especially um, children and German children too. So it's, uh, sorry, I struggle too. I think that's uh, um, I try to, to put it a little bit in perspective and to to transfer to Germany where I'm a little bit safe. <laughs> sorry. 
<laughs> Perhaps we, we just move on. Samuel, may I just uh, change topic um, slightly? Um, from what we've discussed so far, and we haven't gotten into detail, um, sort of there are big categories, race, class, that are, seem to be sharp and dividing line between them and us, uh, if it's put in, 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 the, um, in the perspective of, uh, of the historical actors. Uh, I wonder what are the are the differences on either side of the line. Uh, quite often, if you if you talk about them, they are one group without differentiation. If you talk about us, you see many differences. So um, does that does that make sense to you in, in terms of health health regimes? Uh, um, is there a sharp dividing line, um, and what are the differences between between the uh, on either side of the lines uh, made in health practices? Uh, yeah, I think the um, I mean the dividing lines are they're often sharp until they're not, so to speak. That uh, quite often it would be the will of those of us either in the public or implementing health policy to make those lines more distinct than they actually are. Um, but uh, quite often they, they blur very easily from context to context. Uh, you know, it, it occurred to me that um, I certainly sympathize with my colleagues struggling with the Coke question, um, which probably makes my attempt at it even, you know, pr more pervaded with folly uh, myself. But I, it did occur to me that when, um, the uh, discovery of the tubercle bacillus, you know, which of course is Koch's in the early 1880s, when um, that knowledge arrives here, it immediately sparks uh, not not a well, partly a debate, but also kind of a contest within public health practice about how you prevent the disease tuberculosis, particularly when you start to speak about these racialized others. So it's not a colonial context. Um, necessarily, but certainly a racialized context here. So that, that idea is, is quickly followed in the United States by a theory of house infection, meaning that it's within closed spaces, much like COVID, um, that uh, the bacillus is most easily and efficiently transmitted. And this uh, theory, which motivates a lot of public health action uh, for the next you know, coming decades, well into the 20th century, um, meets an already established and growing Black medical, um, African American medical and public health body of thought, which is arguing for housing improvement, as we had in tenement reform in many, uh, amongst many white populations, but don't reach, you know, reforms that don't reach Black populations. So mm -hmm. even still, the kind of the, the quote unquote authority of science or the authority of a scientist, often when it moves from context to context, it, changes in very different ways yeah. and um you know particularly we start talking about colonized um, or colonial and racialized populations that certainly goes straight to um you know these dividing lines i think in a lot of ways uh, i was really struck by um uh Uta's, uh, uh discussion about war metaphors and how those automatically require an us versus them they require another and and yet that really hasn't stopped us from you know employing war metaphors and language in our public health campaigns that quite easily become you know rationales for policing people with a virus or with a health condition so i, I yeah i think it's a pretty um self-apparent proposition those 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 uh distinctions um so um now I have a question, really I'm gonna to aim towards Sarah that of course builds on the, the themes that we've been discussing that Samuel alluded to with uh, dividing lines and that Uta alluded to with kind of the appropriateness and yet the staying power of war metaphors. So uh, another dynamic that has animated the historical roots of trust and distrust in medical and scientific authority Sarah, and still persisting until the current uh, pandemic is the legacy of abuse, uh, torture, and, and even murder by medical professionals of uh, racialized populations on both sides of the Atlantic. 
So drawing on your research, could you say something about how these violations of medical ethics were possible in earlier periods of US history? And also a bit about the different ways female bodies in particular and, and female sexuality became a target. How did these legacies impact trust in medical and scientific authority among uh, racialized and, and also gen gendered populations? And based on your research and, and the teaching that you do, would you say that vaccines are a particular kind of public health intervention that maybe has a, a unique capacity to uh, create trust or, or distrust? Yeah, so I'm going to do a couple of things here quickly. And one is to kind of loop with the discussion that was happening. And just to sort of, because we're speaking of a global context too, I think too often we think of biomedicine as ubiquitous because it's such the dominant frame. But to think both now as well as historically, people pick and choose. So they might, you know, go to an MD doctor for something and then they might actually drink tea for something else. And they're using those together. So even though the sort of biomedical frame is very dominant, it's dominant sort of within global health, it's dominant sort of with the dominant medical system, it's not the only one, both now or historically. So thinking of that too, and I think that does play into sort of vaccine then trust too, of sort of not sort of just um, automatically assuming that because it's the dominant, that means it's the only or widely totally accepted 100%, because it's never been sort of that dominant. But then per the question is more directed at me and also speaking to what's already been said as well. So I think the legacy of mistrust really sort of stems from a couple of reasons. At basis though, is that there's been such a disparate difference in who has had access to care and who has had access to basically being contained, right? So that there's either sort of idea of um, you're receiving care or you're sort of being contained, whether we're talking about infectious disease, whether we're talking about behavior, whether we're talking about sort of sexual um, sort of ideas about sexuality, those are two sort of themes that have played out, I think, historically. And so that difference, we can still hear echoes now about the, the historical difference about who's been contained and who's received care. I like to, when I sort of teach then about the sort of history of mistrust, both sort of in largely, large, sort of as a large sense, particularly when it comes to research, but not just about who's been subjected to research and or who's been had access to research, is to think by underlying every single re research ethical abuse, we can say is this idea of certain bodies who were deemed useless society, in society or not as useful as other bodies. Science has essentially made them useful by, make, by having them be research subjects. So I think that at base, both historically and right now, that's sort of the basis for all human subject research on ethicalness. So anything, again, historically or now, that sort of idea of bodies are made useful to science and therefore they're not seen as participants anymore. They're not seen as humans anymore. It's their body, the science is what matters more. And I think that's sort of at base two of sort of thinking, one, the sort of useful to, useful to science, there's been an awful long history of bodies particularly racialized bodies, but also within gender too, of whose bodies are deemed useful to science, but then also whose bodies get to actually get the benefits of that science that's being accrued. Okay, and that has also been a difference too, historically, as well as now, which to me feeds into supports. I mean, when I teach about vaccine hesitancy, the first thing I always say is, you know, this is not just, this is not something we should blow off. There are really, really profoundly good reasons for someone to say, I am nervous about getting a vaccine or I don't want a vaccine. That there are some very historically sound reasons for people to be worried about that um, and to be concerned about that as well. Historical reasons that still are playing out today. And um, when it's sort of speaking about specific female bodies and specific sort of about female sexuality, um, sort of to me it's more of sort of the longer history of sort of the patriarchal ideas of within medicine it's been largely sort of dominated by men and by men thinking certain ways about female bodies and how certain female bodies are supposed to be either configured or behave or what they're supposed to um, essentially do and the way physicians have sometimes interacted with bodies to make them 
again, either useful or appropriate. Um, and that to me is then there's a long history of that as well, which can both feed into mistrust about individual doctors as well as sort of the medical system more largely. And that can also then feed into sort of hesitancy about accepting something that either my physician is saying I should do or the sort of medical establishment, the biomedical establishment is saying, this is what's good for you because in the past too often what's good for you actually wasn't necessarily good for you. <laughs> it was maybe good for sort of a, a different population that you're not actually a member of and you're not benefiting from. Okay, we now do have questions uh, from the audience and um, there are two questions that actually continue on the theme of, um, of trust um, and I would like to put this to the, to the other three um, uh, panelists. One is the trust in governments. Do, do you see any differences uh, between trust in different countries, in different, uh, different governments? Um, and um, how, much does, um, how much trust is put into individuals uh, within these governments or individual experts um, within the countries you, you know something about? And the other question, and that's one that Sarah has already um, started uh, talking about, is um, is trust trust in vaccines in in particular um, from experiences? Are there, is there a racial dimension? And Sarah has pointed to historical dimensions um, um, in, in in particular groups, uh, for example, um, uh, towards um, to, uh, regarding trust in in vaccines. So, question of trust in governments, in persons, uh, within the difference between countries and the trust from historical experience, um, particularly on the question of race. Um, and I, I leave it open to who wants to answer uh, or pick it up, um, Malta, Samuel or Uta, um, anyone? Uh, Uta, please. Maybe I start with uh, the question of trust in governments. Um, um, a colleague just sent me a, um, a survey that has been done uh, in France, well, not in France, but by the French um, journal, uh, paper, sorry, national paper, Le Monde. And they ha have did a, a, a survey in uh, four countries, four European countries, um, the United Kingdom, France, of course, Germany, and Italy, um, asking exactly the same kind of questions and uh, going through the answers. And they, of course, then you get this range, you trust fully, you trust half, you trust a bit, you trust, don't trust at all. I'm, I'm kind of suspicious about this grading, but uh, be it as it is, the interesting result for me was that um, in France, both in France and Italy, the trust in government especially when it comes now to uh, dealing with this health crisis and, and putting up public health measures is far, far, far lower than in Germany. So Germany still has the highest, uh, highest number of, of trust in government, which actually comes through, um, especially through the first phase of how the government dealt with the crisis or the, with, with COVID which many people uh, were impressed and, and uh, actually which made the, the figures rise uh, to, a, to an extent that uh, we haven't seen for, well, not for ages, but for, for many years. So the, the ha how, how governments handle the crisis, how consistent they are, but also how transparent they are. And that's one thing that really matters for trust. You can't trust it anybody, be it an institution or be it an individual who has, you know, who goes about things clandestinely, who uh, builds this, this wall of secrets around himself, herself. Um, you need the kind of transparency that um, some governments have been, have been yeah, expressed and, and also have been, have been practicing and others not. Uh, plus, of course, there is this longer and longer uh, tradition of distrust in, and, and uh, probably rightly so, because of very, very fast changing governments in Italy and, and France. So there are different, um, different degrees of trust in government. When it comes to trust in, in persons, 
the interesting thing when, when, pe when people ask, uh, are asked, um, whom do you trust? Do you trust your, your private um, uh, bank? Um, what is it? Uh, the, the, the clerk that, that usually deals with your savings and gives you some good advice. Or do you trust banks at large? People usually say, I do trust the person that I know at my bank, but I don't trust banks. I do trust my personal physician that I've been uh, uh, seeing for, for decades, but I don't trust the medical profession at large, which is all corrupt, et cetera. So there is this sense, there is a, a general uh, uh, propensity, let's put it this way, to trust those that you know that you are in close proximity to and um, refrain from these very anonymous and grand categories that really don't translate uh, for you. So that, but that, that's something we can generalize, which is not peculiar to, uh, to the current uh, situation and to the current health crisis. It's probably been reinforced now with the regulations in place. Who do you trust? Perhaps your husband <laughs> or your daughter? <laughs> so I'm, I'm half joking, but I think it's been reinforced in a way. You, you uh, At least I can say my behavior, I, I put it on how I trust in persons, not necessarily in a risk assessment. Uh, but anyway, that, that's one question. Um, um, Malta or Samuel, do you want to come in on trust as well? Governments or personal trust? You don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> I think just speaking for myself as someone who's, you know, been asked to comment, been asked this question of, you know, a number of times he, in the United States, you know, quite often everyone, you know, particularly last year was uh, concerned with the question of the legacy of medical experimentation on black people and people in prisons, um, you know, various, you know, vulnerable uh, populations. Uh, with, of course, the most dramatic example being the Tuskegee uh, experiment that went on for, you know, four decades until the early 1970s. And I always found that an interesting question to the extent that it often overlooks, you know, contemporary reasons, you know, and good reasons for medical mistrust. Uh, you know, there, there were a number, you know, last year, I, you know, a number of journalists had asked me, you know, when the, when the vaccine finally comes out, how will we convince African Americans to take it, given the legacy of medical experimentation? You know, to which I always answered, you know, the real question is, how will we trust the government to actually get it to them? You know, will they have an opportunity even to reject it? And sure enough, here we are in March, finding out that many Black Americans don't even have the opportunity to reject the vaccine, even if they wanted to. And we're also finding out that um, month by month, the number of African Americans when asked, when polled, who said, yes, they would gladly take the vaccine and they think it would be, you know, good for themselves, good for their families, good for the communities and good for the country has, you know, matched pretty much what white respondents have not exceeded um, that level. So we've been, you know, asking this question about how do we get black people to take the vaccine when I, it's been the wrong question. And I've also been concerned that it's a good way to set up black people as being responsible for, you know, blaming the victim, you know, when they continue to die from this, uh, this condition, uh, we say, well, I guess it's because of black vaccine hesitancy. And that's, I don't think there's no evidence to say that's the case at all. So I think that's a question that we really, um, it's, it's, one of, it's one of those things that leads us to ask wrong questions, much like we do with, you know, like, you know, I argued about tuberculosis, you know, sometime, you know, a century and, and some years ago, or when we talk, talked about HIV in the 1990s and afterwards about, you know, how do we get black people to uh, protect themselves from the virus without thinking about structural health inequities that, uh, you know, they're, they're, that are the medium in which viruses uh, uh, are transmitted. Thank you. Uh, I can see me, do you want to? Yes, so uh, now to turn to a question from the audience. This one is directed at Malta. So uh, Malta, you explained how anti-Semitism played an important role for vaccination politics in Germany. And do you see a direct line to today's conspiracy theories surrounding vaccinations? Or how would you say contemporary conspiracy theories relate to historical racist concepts? 
sorry. <laughs> so no, I got it. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I think yeah, we we can. There are continuity continuities from of antisemitism from from nineteenth century or even from the Middle Ages uh, to today. I think um, after ninety uh, after the Third Reich, um, it vanished uh, for for decades and came back uh, the last years, and it has. Um, uh, nothing to do with uh, with pandemics or or the um, or the health system, the public health, but with a um, with the new rights um, coming coming up. Um, I think there is another continuity which is I think even more interesting, and that maybe I have a chance to come back to your question on on, on colonies and colonization. Um, if you look at Germany, nineteenth and twentieth century. The Germans um, mostly focused on the East as a kind of, of hotspot and health problem. Um, I think that's the most important colony for, for Germany, not Africa. Um, so the East was seen as a dirty, unhealthy and threatening place, um, needed to be immunized, sanitized or improved. And of course, in the, during the Third Reich, uh, this perception is even um, the basis for war plans. Paul Weindling, Winfried Süß, and others have shown in their important, important works. Um, but for many Germans, the East remained an important reference point for the perception of pandemics even after the Third Reich. Um, just two examples, the outbreak of the Asian flu or the Asian influenza in the late 1950s, or the outbreak of the, of the Hong Kong influenza in the late 1960s, fueled prejudices against the, the East. Um, the historian Wilfried Witter, I think I saw him at the registration list, so maybe he's in the audience today. Wilfried Witter has shown how German newspapers uh, criticized the Hong Kong influenza as the Mao Grippe, uh, the influenza of China's leader Mao. Uh, and, even, uh, and even today, in times of, of COVID, the East is once again, I think, an important point of reference again. Um, and this perception of the East is one reason why the Germans, I think, underestimated the COVID pandemic, by the way. Until in January and February 2020, the pandemic was seen as a problem of the others, a problem of, of Chinese people like eating bats or snakes, uh, living in unhealthy and cramped big cities. And that was not just a picture of a yellow press, uh, like the Bild Zeitung, um, but even of magazines like Der Spiegel, uh, reliable magazines. Uh, and that's why for quite a long time, many Germans could not imagine that COVID could also become a problem, not, of, uh, not just for others, but for us also. And I think that's uh, another continuity and a very important um, fi finding on the racial bias in immunization efforts. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Malta. Johannes? Um, well, if I may just accept that that image of the East has drastically changed. <laughs> it may have started like that, uh, but um, some people at least do have a much more positive image of the East now. And um, the East is now in Britain um, or in South Africa or in Brazil. Um, so I think this is actually changeable uh, quite a lot, uh, but it's just... Uh, um, I'm, um, there have been several questions picking up on, on the colonial, um, um, and um, I think two or three of them are from the audience, um, and they point to the question whether um, the colonial medical experiments that have been done by uh, Paul Ehrlich and Robert Koch, um, whether they should not make us rethink um, the naming of um, the institutes, the Robert Koch Institute and the Paul Ehrlich Institutes with the experts um, and the institutions um, um, relied on in, in being relied on in this crisis, whether we should rename them or not. I think this is, of course, a larger debate we've had in, in very different contexts um, in many places um, of the world. Um, but we at least in Germany, we have that issue, um, uh, or we can raise that issue um, definitely um, from this colonial context. Uh, and I wonder whether the audience would like to comment either on the um, on the German case, um, if they 
if they are Germans or if they do know about Germany or whether there are, and that would be the question to Sarah and Sam, whether there are um, similar cases with medical experts honored uh, by institutions um, and whether there's been a debate, um, say, in the United States on that topic. Um, perhaps we, we start with, with Uto or Malta on, on, on the German question, as it's been put by, by, by two or three people from the audience. Should we rename? Should we not rename? What's your what's your take on it? Um, Malta, would you like to start? <laughs> and I can make it short. Um, I think as a historian, I think it's thank you, Ute. Um, I think it's it's great to have the discussions, and that's a, a simple answer. <laughs> I wouldn't change the name <laughs> because we need the discussions. We need to to uh, to discuss what we are standing for and what is uh, yeah. What what's the relationship of of uh, history and and present and so I think it's the best <laughs> what could happen for historians <laughs> keep it. <laughs> That's a smart answer. <laughs> uh, personally, I'm not I'm not a great fan of um, naming institutions for um, great men. Uh, it's usually great men. So I'm. I don't have anything against just dropping names. Uh, I do have any have a lot um, against renaming those institutions and then finding another hero to worship. Um, this said, of course, this is, uh, and I agree with Malta, it's a highly, it's a very, very hot um, political debate just now. Uh, debates are usually well placed because they force us to think about things that we haven't thought about. So uh, congratulations on debates <laughs> wherever they occur. Um, I'm kind of um, hesitant now and, and I, 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 take my, I take my distance actually when um, we uh, are moving towards sanitizing history from everything that for our current sensibilities sounds offensive. Um, it starts with uh, universities um, where they find that a person who I remember as someone who sat in the National uh, Assembly in Frankfurt as a democratic representative uh, is now found out to be have, have voiced anti-Semitic uh, opinions, which basically I would say 90% of German uh, men would in some way or other have done at this time. And now this person has to go. And Robert Koch, who has many merits, uh, who also you know, wouldn't be my personal hero, um, but uh, has made his, himself a name, a world, worldwide known name, is now being uh, dropped as a name giver because, and, and that's, the, that's the accusation that first has to be really proven and, and also kind of put into perspective, and we talked about that before, if really what, and that, that's the, the accusation is that he did something in his experiments in Eastern Africa. He did something that he would never have done in Berlin or in Duisburg or um, in some, some, some place in Europe. This has to be proven and I doubt it. I really doubt it. And, uh, that's, that's, and that's why I'm not kind of immediately uh, jumping on the bandwagon of those who say um, purify Germany from all its colonialist uh, traces. This colonialism is part of German history and we have to put it in perspective and not just say, well, we are such better people now. Uh, we know everything has been wrong and now, you know, get, get out the, 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 the brush and purify. And I'm, I'm, completely against purification. That really kills history and it kills uh, academic and, and public debate. I 
I think we're near, we've been told that we should wrap up, but I think we should give the opportunity to Sam and Sarah, Samuel and Sarah to answer on that on that kind of question. I think it's memorizing what we are living through. And yeah, uh, I, I would just say that the, the, the naming of buildings and monuments is an act of memorialization, not historiography. So I think uh, I, I think it's something different to say that we want to ch you know take down a monument, which is you know this is this is a, a large debate that we've been having here in the United States for about four or five years now. Um, I think it's different to take down a monument or to rename a building, recognizing that it's an act of memorialization and as Uta said of you know heroization, as opposed to erasing somebody from a history textbook, which is an act of you know Orwellian you know purging. I think I think there is a difference. Um, I think if if memorials and buildings were history, all of us would have taken courses in stone masonry and architecture, um, but we didn't. Um, we took courses in method in research methods. So I think I, I share Uta's uh, unease with any type of hero worship, um, except to the extent that as long as if we're going to worship a hero, we should all recognize that this person. May, you know, we will change as a society in generations to come, and someone who we think completely is completely laudable in 2021, our politics may be in a different place in 40 years, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I think, uh, you know, I think the danger is when we start to think of heroes as always being eternal, um, which is, I guess, why I might, why we make a monument out of stone, right? Uh, but stone can be taken down. That's what we have bulldozers for. Sarah. I'm, I'm in agreement with Samuel's comments. So <laughs> that's, yeah. I would, the only thing I would add is I think the historians need to be an active part of the conversations. And oftentimes we're not. Like oftentimes it's, you know, a group of non people who don't actually have sort of a grounding in his, any type of history that's making it those, those types of decisions. Thank you. Well, this has been certainly a fascinating discussion. I know I myself um, have more questions and even comebacks, but we are past time. So I would like to thank uh, my co-moderator, Johannes, uh, for doing this with me, for our distinguished panelists, Uta, Samuel, Malta, and Sarah for joining us today. And I would like to uh, thank my fellow organizations, the German Historical Association and the German Historical Institute for coming together with us here at UC Berkeley to put on this panel. Uh, thank you very much and all of you stay safe.